before we go into this message, I just want to ask a question. And this question is, is what would you do if uh, I told you about an investment that was guaranteed in five years to bring a hundred times your money? Pretty good, right? hundred times your money. What would you do? How would that change your life? Think about it for a moment. This is guaranteed. This is not maybe. This is guaranteed. What would you do? Would you still go to uh, Starbucks every day? Would you still go on vacations every year for the next five years? Would you still want that car right now? Would you still want that new house right now? Oh, how, how would you live? And you might... Some of us would be like, I'm moving out of my house. I'm selling my house and moving back in with my parents even though I'm 60. Did you think, oh, all I got to do is for every $10,000 you save right now, that's a million dollars. Think about that. I can save 100000 at least away, $10 million. That would be pretty good. That would, no, I, I think that we would live differently, right? If we knew five years from now how to invest our money and make 100%. Uh, it was guaranteed. Well, today I have news that's even better than that. I know that is exciting to think about, and that would be so incredible if we were in that scenario, but there's better news than that, and it's this, is that Jesus Christ is coming soon, and very soon. Our King is coming. In Revelations 22, 12, this is the last chapter in the whole Bible. Jesus himself says this, look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward. Say, bring my reward. Oh, he's just not coming to take people to heaven. The Bible says he's bringing my reward with me to pay all people according to their deeds. Well, this is why I asked that question in the beginning of what would you do if there was a hundred times your money you could make in the next five years? Because this is what Jesus says about some of the rewards that he has to give people when, he, when we stand before him. Some of us are going to go to heaven because we died, and some of us are going to go because we were raptured. Hopefully it's the rapture. How many want to go in the rapture? It sounds a little bit better than dying. But we're going to stand before God no matter what, and we're going to be judged, and we're going to be rewarded based on how we lived. And this is a great study. Most Christians don't even know this. They think, if I can just get to heaven, everything's going to be great. Well, if you look at Scripture, it's not about just getting to heaven, like most people think. It's about way more than that. And here Jesus is talking to some of the disciples in Mark 10, 29, starting there. And Jesus replied, and he's talking about spiritual rewards. He says, and I assure you that everyone who has given up a house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or, or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now in return a hundred times. Say a hundred times. It's a good investment living for the Lord, right? We're guaranteed. It's, you're going to get a hundred times. Now there's different rewards in heaven that we see also when it comes to crowns that you're going to get. There's going to be different people that are going to have greater glories than others when it comes to their body. The Bible talks about in Scripture that there's going to be some people that are going to be just so bright because when they are here on earth, they got a lot of people saved. There's going to be different clothing items in heaven for those that lived holy lives that really pursued godliness here on earth. They're going to have a nice garment compared to others that just uh, that weren't living for God full on like, uh, and, and didn't really pursue holiness. And so there will be in heaven, whether you like it or not, it's not what I'm saying, it's what the Bible says, but there's going to be a class system, you could say, in heaven. There's going to be an upper, a lower, a middle class system in heaven. And it's not going to be unfair like, oh, God's a jerk. No, it's going to be because of what you did here on earth. But we see it, it all throughout scriptures. It's there for those that really want to study what it's going to be like. There's going to be such great positions in heaven, like the greatest positions in heaven would probably have to be the 24 elders. Think about that. The 24 elders around God's throne that sit right there. These are humans for all of eternity. 
say there's going to be banquets in heaven the Bible talks about. How many like food? Food is, is food in heaven is going to be way better than the food here on earth, I'm sure. And, and there's going to be banquets, and there's going to be places where you get to sit next to God. And others are going to be just so far, far, far back. Think about a billion people back. You want to be a billion people back away from God, or do you want to be that person that sits right next to the Lord? Do you want to have a, lo light, a nice location in your house and a huge mansion? The Bible says there's mansions. There's, there's big houses that some people are going to have depending on upon how they lived here on earth for the Lord. And knowing all of this, and knowing that Jesus was soon to return, you see that the, the believers in Acts, they lived in a radical way. They were radical Christians. Like, we would look at the average Christian in the book of Acts and say, these guys are crazy. They are selling their houses. They're giving all of their possessions away. They're helping out the poor. They're... they're they're preaching the gospel everywhere. They're willing to die for Christ at any moment. These are radical Christians. Why? Because they understood that it wasn't about just getting to heaven. There's rewards in this. Jesus is coming back any moment. I can't just screw around in life doing stupid stuff, living for myself, fish gang. I got to get serious about this. This is what really matters. This is eternity. You no, know, you got excited about thinking about money and making a hundred times your investment here on earth, but you're going to die one day, and you're not taking that money with you, but the investments we make in heaven, these are eternal. These positions that we have in heaven, these are eternal positions, eternal blessings. Now, this is, this is what really matters. The Bible says store up treasures in heaven. question that we should all ask ourselves, one of the most important questions that we can as a Christian is, am I ready for Jesus to come back any moment? Am I ready for Jesus to come back any moment? Am I living a lifestyle that Jesus could come back at any moment? Or am I just a Christian really at church, around others? Or would it be would it be okay if the Lord just showed up randomly when I watch my favorite shows or I'd be caught doing something that I shouldn't be doing or listening to some of the music I listen to or hanging out with some of the friends I, I hang out with? Or would, would you get caught unexpectedly living for yourself and living in sin willfully? Or are you just always at every moment just trying to live for the Lord, a pure life for God? question we must all ask ourselves if we want to live for the Lord and see great spiritual rewards and be ready at any moment when Jesus comes back. Oh, I think that when we hear that Jesus is coming back soon, a lot of us, it's just like a golf clap. We don't get that excited. We're like, yeah, he's coming. And I don't believe that we're not super excited because we don't believe he's coming back. I think what it is is that we know that Jesus has been saying he's coming back soon for the last 2,000 years. And that doesn't seem soon because in Revelation, that verse I just gave you, in the, in the last part, that was probably given to, you know, the Apostle John was the one that wrote that and he got a vision from the Lord. But you're talking probably around the, the time of 90 AD. That's a long time, right? I don't know what's long to you, but I'm thinking that a long time would be 90 AD. Now, thousands of years, Jesus was saying he was coming soon. And so I, I think that we can lose our excitement, we can lose our intensity to live for the Lord as if he could come back any moment because we know people have been saying this for a long time. Peter actually talks about this in Scripture. He says that people are going to be saying this in the end times, that where is Jesus? Is he really coming back? And in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 4, it says... Most importantly, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come and mocking the truth and following their own desires. We see that today, everywhere. And then it goes on to say, they will say what happened to the promise that Jesus is coming again. What happened? Where, where is Jesus? Why, why is he taking so long? Well, it goes on to say in verse 8, still talking about the second coming of Jesus. 
And Peter says, but you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. So we, we get the, a view of the heart of the Lord here in this moment. The Bible says oh, that the Lord's not really being slow. Like, time to the Lord is just so different. Two years for us might seem like forever. You know, and I, especially as a kid and you're in high school and you're thinking, it's going to be forever until I get to college. It's going to be forever until I can move out of my parents' house, even though it's a few years away. A forever can feel like that's just such a small time, but the Bible says a thousand years can be like a day to God. You know, he's just he's beyond time. He's outside of time. Why is God doing this? Why does it seem like God is taking so long to come back and put an end to all this evil? Because when Jesus comes back, I don't, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is coming back. There's going to be a, a tribulation where God is going to deal with evil. He's going to lock up the devil. He's going to defeat him completely, and Jesus Christ is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. And then there's going to be the great white throne judgment, and then God's going to redo everything, and there's going to be no such thing as sin anymore. No such thing as evil. Every, everyone that was found to go to hell and that was, did not belong to Jesus and all the demons, they're going to be all thrown into the lake of fire for all of eternity and we're going to remember them no more. And there's going to be no more sadness, no more sickness. Everything's going to be perfect. That's our future. Our future is really great. That's why we as Christians should be excited at all times, but in the meantime, we're going through some stuff and why is Jesus delaying? Well, it says very clearly here, He's doing it for our good. Tell your neighbor for your good. He's giving us time. He's giving us time to reach others for Christ. So the, the thing about us is we just want to escape this evil world. We just want to escape. We want to escape sin and all the effects of sin. We don't want to be sick and have disease anymore. We don't want to have to deal with all this craziness in this world. We just want out, but God looks at it different, and he says, no, I love the people that are evil. I don't want to judge them. I don't want to send them to hell. I don't want to come back and destroy all these people. I'm not looking forward to that. The Bible says that he doesn't take joy in that, because he loves everyone. So the Bible says clearly that he's giving us time so that others can be saved. When it comes to the return of Jesus, we're not given an exact date. How many of you have heard of different dates that have been out there before? You probably remember even in the year 2000 was one of those dates where Jesus is coming back. Y2K, you better be ready. Everything's going to collapse. The computers aren't going to work. Right at the strike of midnight, the trumpet blast is going to happen, and we're out of here. Well, there are some people that were saying, not everybody, but there are some. And you, know, you look at different generations, and a lot of generations each had people that were, that got famous of saying, this is when it's going to happen, we need to go out to the mountains, and we need to go out to, oh, some people have even done it in the past where they went out to the, the Mount of Olives, and they said, we're going to meet Jesus at the Mount of Olives, and they waited, and they waited, and but they had to eventually leave, because Jesus didn't come back when they thought Jesus was. Why? Because the Bible says, no man knoweth the day or the hour that Jesus is going to return back to this world. He said, not the angels. So if an angel appears to you and says, this is the date that Jesus is coming back, it's not an angel of God. Now, if no angel knows, the Bible says not even Jesus knows when he's coming back. Only the Father knows. One day, God the Father is going to tell Jesus, he's going to say, son, go down and get your bride. It's time. It's time for this all to be done. It's time to destroy the devil and his works. It's time to go save your church. It's going to be a great day for us, but not so good for others. Will you be ready? The Bible gives us many signs, so there's not a specific date that the Bible gives us when Jesus will return. 
But the Bible gives us many different dates. Or not dates, different signs, not dates. And so there's, there's much talked about when it comes to the return of Jesus. In the Old Testament and the New, we see it all throughout Scripture, over 1,800 references in the Old Testament alone to the second coming of Jesus, and over 300 in the New Testament. When it comes to a storm about to, to blow in, you can tell there's signs, right? You can tell a lot of the time that it's going to storm in the next few minutes. For me, at least, I usually tell that you know, the, the weather gets, with the temperature, it drops really fast. How many of you ever felt that before? It just drops. And then there's like a little wind that picks up, and, it, and you're like, wow, this just really changed all in a moment. And you might not even see any other signs, but you're like, I know there's probably rain about to come. It just feels different in the air all in a moment. And then all of a sudden, you maybe even hear thunder in the distance. Sometimes it's where the clouds start to come in, and you see these really dark clouds, and you're like, no, it's about to storm. I need to get inside. Well, the same thing. When it comes to signs, Jesus has given us signs to be able to say, no, Jesus is coming back soon, and very soon. And one of those places is talked about in the Bible, one of the many, and this is one of these areas that you can just study for years in the Bible and just keep on learning more and more about the different signs and what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. This is not like you can, I can't teach you all this in one message. This is for those that want to just really study the word of God. You know, I, I want to encourage you, go do that. There's just so much on Jesus reigning on the earth. There's so much on the rewards that the Lord has for us. Uh, one person you could study is Perry Stone. We really like Perry Stone and his ministry. We have uh, the Bible school that we're doing, ISO, and he did a whole class. It was like seven or eight sessions just on the rapture that I thought was just so good and is so much more uh, out there. And there's other people. You can't, you don't have an excuse not to know a lot about the Bible. Because YouTube, just look these great men of God up, and, and you can just learn so much, and, and the Internet. And, but I'm going to give you just a little bit today, just a little bit of a taste, and I hope it gets you hungry for more for your own research. And Matthew 24.3 20, says this. The disciples asking Jesus about his return. Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will all these things happen? What will what will sign what will what sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Before we go any further, you're gonna see these words in scripture where it says end of the world, the latter days, the end of the age. What does all that mean? It's all the same thing. What it means is this is an end, really, of an age. It doesn't mean that this is the end of the world and the world is going to be totally destroyed and we're going to go up to heaven and there's going to be no earth anymore. It just means it's going to be a a new day, a new age, where Jesus Christ is going to reign. So it's going to be something totally fresh. The end of the world, you could say, as we know it. And Jesus goes on to tell them, I'm not going to read all the scriptures because it's going to take a long time of what he says there because it's almost a whole chapter. But he goes on to tell them there's going to be false messiahs. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be famines that take place and earthquakes and the church is going to go through a lot of persecution and there's going to be many false prophets that arise. We can look at all that and say, well, it hasn't that been happening for a while? All of these things are happening right now. But a lot of this stuff has been happening for hundreds of years and maybe you could even say a few thousand years since Jesus said this. And so what I want to do is not just look at the general signs, because all these signs are already here telling us that Jesus is going to come soon, but I believe that there's some really specific signs that are just for this generation only that we could say no other generation has seen these signs happen that say that Jesus is about to return. Signs that have only happened in the last hundred years. And Let's take a, a look at a few of these here today. And Daniel 12, 4, it says this. And, and just what's going on here is there's an angel talking to Daniel. And he's saying, but you, Daniel, keep this prophecy a secret. Seal it up until the time of the end. Say, time of the end. It's not going to make sense, basically, until the time of the end. Well, why? Because they're not going to understand this because it's not going to happen yet. 
And he goes on to say, when many will rush here and there, and knowledge will increase. Why doesn't the Bible say, when cars come, when airplanes happen? Well, you've got to remember, this has been prophesied to Daniel from an angel at 600 B.C. If the angel started to talk in terms that we know, Daniel would be like, what? This doesn't make sense. Like, you got to speak in terms like that we understand. That's why even in Revelations, it can even say bow and arrow. And I believe a lot of that is talking about missiles and other stuff that, that's going to, that in our day and age, because how else would you say missiles? How would you say that there's going to be jets and helicopters and, and tanks? So you have to look at this through the perspective that these people, when they were told about the end times, they were told in a way that they could kind of understand. And so here, let's break this down. What, the first thing the angel says at the time of the end, there's going to be many that will rush here and there. Well, in the last hundred years, we're getting around a lot better than your great, 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 great grandparents. You know, it's, it's way nicer. We're going around the world. How many of you have been to uh, a lot of around the world? How many of you have been to Asia or Europe or Africa or somewhere else, another continent? So if I would have asked that hundreds of years ago, You'd have almost nobody raising their hand, getting around the world. Because it just wasn't easy. You were going horse and buggy. You were going on a boat. It was not easy to travel, and it took a really long time. But now we have the technology with cars. We get around. It's really easy to work 30 minutes away with driving. But think about 100 years ago, if, if you were driving 20 miles to go to work in your horse and buggy, that would take a long time to be able to get where you're going. We, we get here and there and rush all over. That makes sense for this generation. What's really interesting, too, is here it says the knowledge will increase. Well, up until, they say, the year, or the, the 1900s, up until then, when it comes to knowledge, knowledge was only increasing double every 100 years. So mankind's knowledge of understanding was only doubling every hundred years. That's not that fast, if you think about it. Up until the 19, uh, up until 1900, and then after that, it started just coming at a at a pace that's just way faster. And about 10 years ago is when I read this. This was actually from an article that a, that a college did a, a study, and they said about 10 years ago that knowledge was increasing at a, a double every one year. So just think about a hundred years ago. And further, every 100 years, knowledge was doubling. And now every year, 10 years ago, which I'm sure it's even more than that now, knowledge is doubling. It's crazy. What's going on? I believe that's a, a prophetic word that we have for this generation, that knowledge will increase. Now, they thought that knowledge was increasing a couple hundred years ago at a pretty good spot. But now we know that this was for our generation, just how crazy rapidly it was going. And just for instance, some of you were born before TVs were born. Some of you were born before the cell phone came out. Some of you were born, probably a lot of you were born before the internet came out. And I know that some of these younger people here are thinking, how in the world did you live? How did you survive? You mean you didn't have a TV, a cell phone, or the internet? Oh, I think if we went back in time with a lot of younger people, they just wouldn't know how to communicate. They wouldn't know what to do with their life because they say about eight hours a day people spend on either the internet, cell phone, or uh, computer TV. Crazy. But the world has changed in just such a small amount of time. Just only 14 years ago, the iPhone came out with a smartphone. In 2007, that's... That's not that long ago. I remember being in high school, and there was no smartphone with Apple. It was after. I was in college, that it just came out. I remember I had one of those Razor phones. I don't know if any of you had those Razor phones. That was the cool phone of, of the time, at least when I was in high school. And you know, you, all you really could do on the thing was text and talk. And, and they had some kind of internet thing on there, but it was just so slow. You're like, this is just worthless. But talking and texting, that was, that was a big deal, the text especially. And I remember as a kid growing up, and then there was cell phones that my dad would have, and they looked more like bricks. So if I showed my 
little four-year-old and two-year-old one of those phones, they might not know what it is. They might think it is a landline phone that just doesn't have the attachment to it anymore. It was just so big and bulky. I remember just about 10 years ago talking to my dad saying, we need to get a new big screen TV in the basement. This is not 10 years. This is probably actually more like 15 years ago. And uh, it was after I got home from college. And, and he said, okay, fine, but you've got to sell the, t the TV in the basement, and I'll get a another TV for the house. Well, this is one of those older TVs. Where it was a 55-inch. It was when you bought it, these were like the cool TVs. But now, trying to get that thing out of a basement. Oh, this thing weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds, you know, being 55-inch. Now you could give a 55-inch TV to a kid and be like, hey, could you walk this, you know, and up the upstairs? And it's just like, it's just so light. 20 pounds might be a 55-inch TV now. But back in those days, it was hundreds of pounds trying to get that thing out. Like, I, I think we had to get a U-Haul or something like that to even transport that thing to get rid of it. I was, like, like willing to even pay for someone to take it so my dad would pay for a new big-screen TV for my... PlayStation back in those days. <laughs> but how has times changed? They just changed so fast. And I just want to do a little fun test with us here today. Let's see if you remember this sound. This was the sound that you'd hear every single day of your life a few decades ago. If you were older. Let's see if you remember this. I don't know if you remember this sound. But every time you went on the computer, you'd have to listen to that sound. And I remember as a kid going on the computer, and I'd have to dial up. And sometimes you'd have to dial up a couple times for it to go through. And each time it would take about 30 seconds at least, a few minutes, to be able to just do anything on the computer. And back in those days, you'd click on a button. And it would take a few seconds. It would take like three, four seconds to go to the next screen. So you're like now you're just used to everything being so instant. It, we, back in those days, you thought that was quick. Uh, they were, nowadays, like you go back then, you'd be horrified to just see how, how long it took for us to do anything uh, on the computer. And I, re I remember also you had to have multiple lines at your house. How many remember that? If you wanted to be able to be on the phone and also be on the computer at the same time. Well, we had one line for a while. And you can only imagine living with my dad and how he is with his phone, always yelling at me, hey, get off the internet. I need to get on the phone. I got to do some work. So like when I got on, you'd have to take two minutes to get on eventually. Then it takes forever to even click on a few things to get anywhere. And then within five minutes, my dad said, get off. I need to get on the computer or get on the phone. So it's just awful being in that house at that time for anyone that wanted to be on the computer. You know, if you know him, try to get that phone out of his hands. Like, I think we're going to have to bury it with him because he won't let it go, even in death, probably. <laughs> but let's go on to the last sign I want to give us today here when it comes to what I feel like is just a really great sign for us that we're at the end times of this generation. And it's this, but it has to do with Israel. And starting with Hosea 3, 4 through 5, and it says, For the children of Israel shall abide many days, say many days, without king or prince. Israel is not a nation for a really many days. Many, many, many days. And without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim, afterwards the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall... Fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. So we see here that the Bible talks about that there's going to be many days, and you're going back all the way to the Old Testament, where Israel's not going to be a nation. There's not going to be a king. There was not even a king in the time when Jesus was there over Israel. Israel oh, was owned pretty much by the Romans at that day. And it's saying that there's, there's going to be no Israel for a long season, but then Israel shall return, and people are going to see the Lord's goodness in the latter days. Well, just by us seeing the birth of Israel take place in the last hundred years, 1948, it's a sign for us that we are in the last days. Jesus is about to come. At any moment, we don't know when, but 
at any moment. Just think about Israel and just how incredible that prophecy is. Like, if you really look at this, you can't deny there's no God because this was prophesied thousands of years ago that Israel would come into existence. There was thousands of years where people were maybe thinking, is Israel really going to happen? I don't know if I believe this. There was people that were even preaching. You know, what God was really talking about was the church and not really Israel and that God is going to raise up the church in the end times because people didn't really maybe believe that Israel is really going to come to birth because there's nothing going on there. But yet 2,000 years or more goes by and Israel becomes a nation. And not just any nation. They become a great, powerful nation. Oh, they, they have a really great military. They got a great economy. Oh, they, they've really gone through just so much over the years of all of these battles. Just look at the Six-Day War and God miraculously saved them. It's not because they're so smart and so they're so great. It's because the favor of God is upon them. Why is it that we see Israel all the time in the news? Why is it the hot zone of the world where there's just so many people that are trying to say so many bad things about Israel? Why? Because the devil hates Israel. Israel. He wants to destroy the promise of God. He's always wanted to do that. That's why he's gone forth when Jesus was about to be born. He took over the heart of Herod and said, we're going to kill all of the babies to try to stop the promise of God. That's why when Moses was about to be born, he took over the heart of Pharaoh and said, we're going to stop the promise of God from happening. We're seeing that today, that there's a push in our colleges. There's a, a push and some of the media to say, we need to destroy, to dismantle Israel. Israel is bad. Israel is evil. Why? It's because it's a satanic agenda. And I'm not saying that all Israel is perfect with everything that they do. But I am saying that the favor is, of God is upon them. And it is the devil behind it at work to try to destroy that nation right now. The Bible says also in Isaiah 66, 8, it says, Who has ever seen anything as strange as this? Who has ever heard of such a thing? Has a nation ever been born in a single day? Has a country ever come forth in a single moment? There's no country that has ever come from nothing after 2,000 years into existence. It's never happened. But yet it was prophesied in the Bible. When Isaiah wrote that prophecy, it was about 700 years before Christ. 2,700 years ago, before it even happened, it was prophesied that in one day, Israel would become a nation. That prophecy took place in May 14, 1948. Some of you are alive then. Isn't that incredible? The promise of God coming forth. There's a verse also that I want to mention here that has to do with Israel and about the second coming of Christ that I, I think that if you look through the Bible and, and you look at different parts, you can tell that the Bible talks in symbolism a lot. And there's some sections that you won't even understand. If you, under, if you understand the symbolism, you can understand what is being said there. But if you don't understand the symbolism, you'll miss out on the, the deep things that God is trying to speak in those verses. And this is a really interesting verse to me. And I heard this from some prophetic teachers when it comes to the end times, and I thought, oh, wow, this is really incredible. And it's Hosea 6, verse 2, and it says this, After two days, say two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. You know, I, I believe that many people had no clue what this meant for just so long. Well, what is, why does he say after two days, He's going to revive us, talking about the second coming of Christ. Like, obviously, it's taking more than two days. Like, this doesn't make sense. Well, let's go back to the verse that we said earlier in Peter. And then Peter says, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Well, if you put the symbolism there, and you, instead of two days, you say, in 2,000 years, he will revive us. That makes a lot of sense. All of a sudden, Israel is going to be birthed in 2,000 years, and on the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live 
the site. What does that mean? That means during the next thousand years, it's going to be the reign of Jesus. He's going to be here on the earth. When you look at it with that kind of symbolism, with perspective, you're like, wow, look what God's doing. We are in the end times. He's about to be back. Any day now, we could see First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians come into play. And if I could have the band start to come up. And it says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves, then together with them we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and then we will be with the Lord forever. What an exciting verse. That I, My prayer is that I'm part of that generation. We're in a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, the Bible says, that I'll be transformed and be with the Lord forever. I'll leave this body that I have right now and take on a new body that's like Jesus. We don't know what that body's going to be like, but I, I view it in a way as it's going to be like Superman. I would love to have Superman's body. No, you can't get sick, can't get hurt. The only kryptonite can hurt him, but know it, there's going to be no kryptonite with these new bodies. There's going to be nothing that can cause you to be in pain. I, I believe that through Scripture, we look at the body of Jesus. It was able to walk through walls. It was able to teleport. It was able to fly into a sin. I think we're going to have some pretty cool abilities in the next body that God gives us. And the Bible says we'll be with the Lord forever. I want to leave you with this last verse here today, and it says in Luke 12, 40, you also must be ready at all times for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Say least expecting. And he's going to come at a time when no one's expecting it. You know, there's people that believe in the rapture happening before the middle, and the end of the tribulation. The tribulation, when Jesus comes back, I believe it's pre, and I think one of the, there's so many reasons I, I believe that, but I believe there's a pre-rapture before the tribulation takes place. It's because that verse right there, I think, is a really clear indicator because if it's at the end, well, we know the day, like, basically. We know the exact moment Jesus is coming back at the end of Armageddon. It's right at the end of seven years, so people are going to be expecting it. For those that say the rapture is then, that verse doesn't make sense. A lot of those people I find like to sell food too to people, saying get ready, that believe in the post-trib. Then there's people that believe in the mid-trib, or you can still know you'd be pretty ready saying he's going to come back any time because there's not that much time, only seven years, and in the middle he's coming back. You know, he could be back any second. We're going to be expecting as the church. You know, the time that I believe is really a lot of people are not going to be uh, expecting his return is before all of this craziness breaks out and he's coming to save us. Just like he came and he saved Lot, just like he came and he saved Noah, judgment isn't for the church. Judgment are for those that don't belong to God. And today, my prayer is that we're a church that's ready. My question for you out of all the things I want you to get here today is, are you ready? Are you living a life that you're ready at all moments? I want everyone just to bow your heads, close your eyes. And if you're here today and you can't say with assurance, without certainty, that you're ready, if Jesus would come back right at this moment to be caught up with him. One thing's guaranteed is one day we're going to stand before God. You're not going to live forever. You're either going to die on this earth and meet God, or you're going to get raptured and meet God. But you don't know that day. You don't even know the day of your death. It could be today. I pray not, but it could be. Are you ready to stand before God on Judgment Day? If you're here today and you're not sure, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, Jesus to take away our sins. God made the way for us because we are sinners. The Bible says we all deserve death. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment. But God so loved us so much that he sent Jesus to come to die for us, to take away our sins. If we would believe in him, the Bible says, that we are saved by faith and faith alone. It's not by your works. The Bible is so clear that it's not by you being good enough that you'll ever make it into heaven. It's by your faith that you make it into heaven, by your trusting in the Lord, by your giving your life over to him. That is the only way to be ready when you stand before God.
If you're here today and you say, I want to I want to place my faith in Jesus. I want to be 100% certain that if I die today, if the rapture happened today, that I wouldn't be left behind. I know that I know where I'd be. On the count of three, if that's you, you want to be certain. You want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. I just want you to slip up your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. I see your hand. 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 I see hands all over. Once you put it up, you can just put it right down. We can just all stand to our feet. And for those of you that have already prayed this prayer before, let's just pray it also with them as encouragement. And there's nothing magical about these words that we're about to say. Where the power is, where the life change happens is with you believing with what you're saying here. Repeat after me, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. And I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. Three days later, for me, from this day forward, I give you all of my life, all that I am, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let's just give them a hand, those dozen or so people that raised their hand. We're so excited for you and your new walk with the Lord. We're going to have some people on the prayer team up here too if you need to ask anyone what it means to serve the Lord or need prayer. We do have free Bibles if you don't have a Bible out in the VIP table after the service. Love you all. Have a great week and be blessed.